for Brother Please come to the stage, Brother Carl Young. And let's give that black warrior a rousing round of applause. I am Harold Mohammed, Minister of Mohammed Smart, number 46, New Orleans, Louisiana. We are so grateful and thankful to Almighty God Allah, who came to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and raised up in our midst a divine leader, a divine teacher, and a perfect guide in the personage of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But brothers and sisters, if I live to be a thousand, I could never thank Allah enough for blessing us with a bold, fearless black man in the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We thank Allah for Archbishop Stalin and for Bishop John Marie, bold and brave black men, who has, as Jesus said, know ye the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They stood up and told the Pope, take what you got and go. I'm going home to my people. We thank Allah for this. We are happy to be here tonight as the co-host of this historic event. And we just want to very briefly give you a summary of what brought us to this day and time. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us and his number one student, the Honorable Minister Farrakhan, teaches us that history is best qualified to reward our research. If you are ignorant of yesterday, it's no wonder you are lost and don't know what's going on today. But if you understand, that yesterday or today was built on yesterday, then you can look to tomorrow. You can carve and shape a future for yourself independent of your oppression. We have been asleep here in the hells of North America like Lazarus laying at the rich man's gate begging for crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. But we are waking up and the Spirit of God is moving among the people. The graves are waking up and the dead are rising. How do you know? Because on September the 8th, the Times Picayune published a letter written by Reverend and Attorney A. Morgan Bryan Jr. And the letter stated that Jesus is not of African origin, nor is he black. Well, a few days ago, the black community would have read it and put it aside and just forgot it. But on this historic day, my phone rang and it was a warrior for the cause of liberation for black people on the other end of the line. Brother Carl Gallman says, get your picture you, turn the page, so and so and so and so. We've got to do something about this, and we've got to do it now. I say, come on by, Brother Carl, let's go have coffee. We had coffee and read the article, we examined it. We said, look, we need to debate the individual who wrote the letter. We respect his opinion. He has a right to an opinion. 
but we believe that he is wrong. Black people are not deaf, dumb, and blind anymore. We realize that we were brought here in the bowels of slave ships, and the same people that brought us here gave us an image of Jesus that looks just like them. We not bad to them. Go ahead. And we don't need to take a white Jesus and then take a black paintbrush and stroke Jesus just to boost our own ego. That's right. That ain't what it's about. We say emphatically, and we shall be proved here tonight that Jesus of the Holy Bible is a black African, and he is ours. All praise is due to Allah. Glenn B. Jean Marie is so happy that Allah produced for us such men as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, of Archbishop Dunn, and we have in our midst a student of the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a student of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who's going to present our case. We've got to understand the seriousness of tonight. Never before in the annals of our history, our sojourn in America, has a slave stood up to confront the slave master right. and say, you lying. And I'm a part of the world, you lying. So we have with us tonight, and you'll hear from him in a minute, a warrior and a champion. Minister and Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. Phi Delta Phi 
and Theta, Chi, and served in the U.S. Air Force during 1951-1955. He's been practicing. He's been a practicing attorney in New Orleans since 1956. The first 23 years were with Dorf, Kerrigan, and Stahl. The next three as a founding senior partner in Brian Simon, Perrington, Smith, and Redfern. The next four years as a founding senior partner in Fourier, Brian, Hardy, and Zatsky. And currently from 1986 as a sole practitioner in his own profession, law cooperation with offices at 700 Camp Street, New Orleans. He primarily handles civil litigation in the construction, surety, and architect, engineering, and tort field. Memberships are held by Attorney Morgan in the American Louisiana State New Orleans Bar Association, the ABA Tort and Insurance Practice Section, Fidelity and Surety Committee, and its Forum Committee on the Construction Industry, International and Association of Defense Council, Fidelity and Surety and Architect, Engineer, Construction Litigation Committee, Defense Research Institute, and Louisiana Association of Defense Council. He is an arbitrator for the American Arbitration Association, is listed in Who's Who in the World, Who's Who in America, Who's Who in American Law, Who's Who in Religion, and numerous other such biographical works. Is a past president of the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary Board of Trustees, and was, from 1982 to 1987, a Special Assistant Attorney General for the state of Louisiana. As part of a team of trial lawyers handling the Creation Science Balance Treatment Act litigation in the Federal District Court in New Orleans and Baton Rouge, the Fifth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, and the U.S. Supreme Court. Attorney Morgan has lectured and written over the years and still does so regularly. On all aspects of construction and surety practice, surety rights, security rights, architects and engineer professionals, liabilities, product liabilities, and the like. At clean seminars of various national, state, and local bar associations, business and professional groups, trade associations, and LSU law centers and CLE Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, Attorney A. Morgan Bryant. And now, at the red, black, and green table, we have Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. His voice is penetrating, penetrating, firm, at times, raspy, and always musical. His language ranges from highly articulate to street corner gutsy. His presence is forceful, militant, powerful, noble. His sense of humor can have the audience bouncing in their seats with laughter. Yet his ability to paint the seriousness and pain of the black experience in America can bring tears to the eyes of the toughest of his listeners. And his head is shiny, black, and bald. <laughs> but the most distinctive trait of the handsome, gigantuous black man is that he speaks from the human rights of black people and all oppressed people around the world. Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad 
has seized upon a monumental mission with vigor and enthusiasm. And the result is a fiery orator that leaves no who hear the message unchanged. He is currently Associate Director of the Urban Crisis Center. The UCC is a race relations, human relationship institute in Atlanta that is highly acclaimed by such clients as U.S. Steel, Inland Steel, Federal Express, New York Transit Authority, police agencies, city, state, and federal government agencies. IBM, Xerox, AT&T, and many Fortune 500 corporations. He's a scholar, historian, orator, and activist. He has taught in the Pan-African Studies Department of California State University at Los Angeles, California State University. He was a recipient of the Ford Foundation Fellowship to do in he was a recipient of the Ford Foundation Fellowship to do intensive studies at Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. Armed with a Purple Heart and Valor Award from the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Countries Movement of the 60s, he has traveled six times on fact-finding and research missions to Egypt, six times to Mecca and the Middle East, and three times to Jerusalem. He has had first-hand experience, has seen with his own eyes, and has lectured in every major city, town, and township in South Africa on liberation. Because of his love and dedication to the liberation and salvation struggle of the downtrodden, the grassroots, the street gangs, and the black masses in general, he is loved and honored for his strong, bold, uncompromising principles stand the world over. You can hear him on the world famous, famous popular rap group Public Enemies album, It Takes a Nation, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. Public Enemy tells the world to their tremendous respect for Dr. College and how he has been a great inspiration to them and their climb to the top of the chart and in their great quest to raise the consciousness of black mass. You can see and hear him on the Public Enemy Fight the Power album. You can also see him on videotape from Spike Lee's blockbuster, mo uh, blockbuster movie, Do the Right Thing. The rising brilliant rap star Ice Cube of Africa Most Wanted, a promising bright star of beggar movie, Boys in the Hood says that Dr. Khalid Muhammad opened his eyes and taught him what time it is. You can hear him on Ice Cube's new album, Death Certificate. Since the mid-1970s, he has been a presenter at colleges, universities, and major international conferences around the globe. He has traveled and lectured extensively throughout Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. He has served as Minister of Defense and Supreme Captain of the Elite Troops of Islam and National Spokesman, International Ambassador of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Presently, he holds a portfolio of National International Special Assistance and walking in the footsteps of both Minister Malcolm X and Minister Farrakhan. Dr. Khaled serves in the same role in the black movement. He is the minister of mosque number seven, based in Harlem, Brooklyn, and New York. He is a member of the Honorable Marcus Garvey UNIA, African Communities League. This revolutionary scholar of national and international recognition is also a member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization and has lectured on most of the American campuses in, in Nigeria, Egypt, Ghana, Libya, South Africa, Uganda, Canada, England, France, and Italy, and has, and has fired and inspired audiences at Howard University, Hampton University, Morehouse, Clark, Morris Brown, Harvard, Yale, 
of the University of California at Long Beach. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. notified by the sound of the African drum when you have 10 minutes to close. At the 45 minute, at the, at the 45 minute time, you will be notified again by the sound of the African drum. Gentlemen, I ask that you strictly adhere to this time constraint. You will each have 30 minutes of rebuttal time. You will be notified by the African drum when you have 10 minutes to close. At the 30 minute closing time, the African drum will sound again, indicating your time is up. 45 minutes will be allowed for closing arguments. The African drum will sound at the 10 minute time. 15 minutes. You have, uh, okay. 15 minutes will be allowed for the closing arguments. The African drum will sound at the 10 minute time and at the closing 15 minute time limit. Gentlemen, we all anxiously await the great debate on this most timely topic. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I present to you the Reverend Attorney A. Morgan Bryan, Jr. I would know nothing among you say, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm here tonight, and I'm not a reverend, incidentally. I'm a layman. I'm a member of a local Baptist church. I'm not an ordained minister. I am a practicing lawyer, but I want to tell you something about the perspective from which I come to this debate or dialogue as I was led to understand it was going to be. I don't pretend to try to convince you of my point of view through rhetoric. As a trial lawyer, I know a great deal about rhetoric, but I don't plan to use rhetoric tonight because I don't think rhetoric is what's involved in trying to present a view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, I'm not here to argue the point. I'm going to present to you as best I can and as best the Lord allows me to do so, my view on the subject. How God works in the hearts of each of us in terms of belief and what we believe or don't believe, what we accept or don't accept, that's up to him and his Holy Spirit as he deals with the hearts and minds of men and women, human beings. I don't believe in arguing points of this sort, and I will not argue them. I will try to discuss them as best I can. I also am coming to you from the perspective of not wanting to consider this a great debate as it's been declared in these opening comments. I don't know where that came off, great debate. I'm not a great debater. I'm an ordinary layman who had a viewpoint and I expressed it in a letter to the editors of the Picayune. And incidentally, the letter that appeared in the Picayune edited out all of the scripture references that were in my letter to the editor. Hence, those of you who read the letter in the, in the letters column didn't get the benefit of the perspective that, I, that was major in my, in my viewpoint, and that was it's a biblical perspective. I'm not competent to debate Dr. Khalid on matters of the Koran. I confess to you that I don't know much about the Koran. As an educated person, I know, I know what it is, but I've never studied it, I've never read it, and I don't purport to be any kind uh, of an articulator of things in the Koran. I don't know that much about the nation of Islam, other than what I read in the newspaper. So I'm not, I don't say that to be facetious, I say that to simply be honest before you so that you know where I'm coming from. I'm not competent to debate with Dr. Khalid uh, fine points of doctrine or the tenets of belief of Islam or the nation of Islam. Uh, or what uh, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan stands for, or what many of you stand for in that respect. 
I don't see that as the point of my being here tonight. I was simply asked by, on the telephone the morning after the, the letter appeared in the Picayune, would you be willing to debate with somebody the point that you expressed in the letter? And I said, certainly I'm willing to do that. And I am willing to do that. But I'm doing it from a biblical perspective. Now I want to tell you one other thing about myself, not that I want to emphasize myself because I don't. I want to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in anything I do and say and think here tonight. But I do want you to know this. I became a Christian 40 years ago. I was in my middle year of law school at LSU when I was led to Christ by a minister, a young Baptist minister. He had been witnessing to me for approximately a year before I finally received Christ in my heart, humbly repenting of my sins and trusting him as my Lord and Savior. Prior to that, I had been an arrogant, cocky, smart aleck, uh, cynic, probably an agnostic. I was never an atheist. I always believed there was a God, but it didn't bother me and it didn't interest me. I was an agnostic in that I did, couldn't care less about God and the things of God. But once I was reached for the me with the message and the gospel of Christ, I gave my heart to Christ there when I was a young man in my 23rd year. I'm 63 years old now. And I received Christ and I accepted him. Since that time, I've been a member of Southern Baptist churches. The overwhelming majority of my church life, 35 of the 40 years, has been spent right here in New Orleans, in First Baptist Church of New Orleans. I'm a deacon in that church and I'm a Bible teacher in that church. And that's all. That's all I present to you by way of qualifications for what we're doing here tonight. As a practicing lawyer, having to be busy about my business in order to support my family, I did not have any time and did not spend any time, because I didn't have it, to prepare myself uh, by going back, back and doing any research in anthropology or sociology or archaeology or any of the, or history, ancient history, or any of the things that probably have a bearing on this issue. But as I said, my letter was primarily written from a biblical perspective, and that's all I feel at least somewhat qualified to deal with you about tonight. And that's all I intend to do. If that causes me to be regarded as the loser in the debate, so be it. Uh, and I'm not conceding defeat at the outset. I'm simply, I'm simply mentioning to you my limitations. I think it's important for you to know that I have those limitations. I, I don't come before you as somebody qualified in the same way that Dr. Khalid is. On the other hand, he may not be qualified in some of the areas that I'm qualified in. Now, I don't have any political agenda. There will be absolutely nothing in my presentation that has anything to do with uh, a human struggle, uh, and I'm not, I'm not minimizing those things. I'm simply saying that's not on the agenda for me tonight. If it is on his agenda, then so be it. I'm not prepared to deal with that, and probably won't other than as I deal with the subject that I was given uh, to come here and dialogue over. Now, having said all of that, I will go ahead and make my presentation to you. Incidentally, I didn't, I didn't quite understand why there was a lot of laughter when, as I was being introduced, it was commented that I was at the red, white, and blue table, and I didn't hear comparable laughter when Dr. Khalid was stated as being in the other table with other colors. I don't know the significance of that, but if it has anything to do with a denigrating of my Americanism, and I am an American, then I can't say that I care for that. I'm a citizen of this nation, I was born in this nation, and incidentally, I'm not a representative of slave masters. That was mentioned. I'm not a, a representative of slave masters, despite the fact that I'm, I'm white. All whites have no sympathy with slavery. Some whites may, but not all whites do. I do not, never did. I grew up as a child in this city and never had any such, uh, such uh, uh, attitude. I also say to you that as best as I know myself, and we can often be wrong about ourselves. Others see us better than we see ourselves. But as best as I know myself, I am not a bigot, and I don't have any anti-black racist views, despite the fact that I have a view regarding Jesus and his origin and his ethnic background. That has nothing to do with racism. That has to do with the way I interpret and understand the Bible. Finally, I will say to you that, uh, so that you'll understand what I feel about the Bible, what I believe about the Bible. I accepted the fact, when I became a Christian, that this is the divinely inspired Word of God. I believe that entirely. I have no doubts about it in my mind, and I have no qualifications to bring to that stated proposition. 
I believe that the Bible is not only the divinely inspired Word of God, but because I believe that, I believe it's inerrant. I believe it's infallible. I believe it is without error, despite the fact that human beings were God's instruments in writing the Bible. I don't concede that because human beings wrote the Bible, it can have any error in it, because I believe that if God is overseeing in his divine way the production of what he intends to be produced by these errant human being writers, God alone can control the outcome. God can see to it that the outcome is one that is precisely what he intended. And that's what I believe about the Bible. Hence, everything that the Bible states, to me, is believable and is true and is what God is trying to reveal through a written record, through a written word, to humankind. It was what I read in the Bible about Jesus that led me to put my faith and my trust in him 40 years ago. I have only two main points in my belief that Jesus was not of black African origin. And both of these beliefs, as I said, are not based on a bigoted point of view or any anti-black racism in my heart. They're based solely on what I understand the scripture to, re to, to reveal. First is that I believe Jesus is plainly shown in the scripture to be the divine incarnate son of God Almighty, Jehovah Elohim. I believe that that's who Jesus the Christ is. I believe he is the eternal pre-incarnate Christ, the div a divine member of the triune nature of the Godhead, a mystery that I don't understand. I don't understand how God, well, I believe fiercely that God is one, that God is a one is one God, the, the, the ruler, the creator of this entire universe, the eternal almighty being in this universe, and how he has chosen to reveal himself in the person of the Son and the Holy Spirit is an enigma to my mind. I don't profess to be smart enough or eternal enough or infinite enough to understand all the parameters of that, but I do believe it. I believe it because God's word reveals it. So I believe that Jesus the Christ is the pre-incarnate, eternal, second person of the triune nature of the Godhead. And I believe he came into this world in the flesh, in the form of the, of the servant, in the form of human beings, in the form of sinful man, though he himself was not a sinner, never committed sin, never had any intention to commit sin. But I believe that Jesus was God incarnate and walked upon the face of this earth, lived on this earth for approximately 33 years. And his purpose in the coming in the first advent was to do the work of redemption and atonement for the sins of mankind at the cross at Calvary in order that human beings who would put their faith and their trust in him would be able to have eternal life, would be able to have an eternal life after this life in the heavenly realm with God. And I believe that it's necessary for people to have their faith and trust in Jesus the Christ in order to be saved, in order to be saved from perdition and to eternal uh, heavenly bliss. Now, I believe that God had his own purpose, and I don't know his reasons for why he chose to pull out of the nation a man named Abram, later to be called Abraham, and made a covenant with Abraham, and among other things gave him a promise of a certain geographical portion of this earth called the Promised Land, Canaan, but also gave him, more importantly than that, a promise of posterity, a promise of seed, a promise of seed which God said to Abraham would bless all the nations of the world. He didn't limit it to any one nation. He said the blessing of that seed to the world would be to the world. And I believe that God has his own reasons for why he chose Abraham. And then Abraham is therefore the progenitor, the originator of a line, a genetic line, a line that descended from Abraham that comes all the way down to Mary and to the, the person that was born from the body of Mary, uh, Jesus, uh, but Jesus himself having no human father because the scripture reveals that the Holy Spirit of God overshadowed Mary and caused miraculously and supernaturally the conception to take place within a virgin who had had no relations with mankind, and that is the, the human birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I believe that, that these are the things that the Bible reveals to us about who Jesus is and how he came into the world. I believe that while he was on this earth, he was prepared for the, for the climactic event of the cross and the resurrection. The cross is the place where ignominiously and, and, and largely disbelieved in and rejected and despised, he bore the penalty that you and I as human beings owe because of our sins. We are all sinners. I believe the scripture declares that we're all sinners. We're all born short of the glory of God. We're all born 
under the condemnation of our sin and in need of being redeemed and saved by what Jesus has done. Jesus made it possible by what he did. And I don't regard Jesus as merely a great prophet. I believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God. And to me, that's more than just Son in the conventional sense. That Jesus is, in a mysterious way that I don't understand, Jesus is God himself incarnate in a second person of a triune nature of the Godhead in which God has sought to reveal himself to man other than by revealing the full, eternal, infinite attributes of the holy, almighty God. I believe it would be impossible for God to reveal all of that staggering attribute about himself to, human, to mere mortals, to mere human beings. That's why the incarnation is such a special event for bringing God into the world so that he'd have a confrontation with human beings and a fellowship with human beings and a walk among human beings and then go to the cross and do the work of atonement in dying of the sacrificial death, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then I believe that Jesus was miraculously resurrected by his own power and the power of God Almighty and not through any human intervention. And I don't believe you can explain the, re the resurrection in rational terms. I believe that the resurrection is, is, a, is, a, is a supernatural, eternal act of the Almighty God. And Jesus was raised from the grave, glorified, no longer in a mortal existence, no longer in a corruptible existence, no longer destined the way all flesh is destined to a grave there to corrupt and, and permanently decompose but was raised, glorified, and in eternally equipped bodily form from which he walked the earth only another 40 days and then ascended back to the heavenly realm. And I believe that Jesus, in his glorified, in his glorified post-resurrection form, is promised, he himself is promised, to return to this earth at the end of time. And I'm not trying to get into the details of the return of Christ as I believe them and as I understand them from the Bible, but I am trying to say that I believe in a risen Savior, a resurrected Savior, who is ascended and on high at the right hand of God the Father now, constantly interceding for all of those who have their faith and their hope in Him, and who is promised to return at the end of time, the exact time of which we know not. We are privileged to know some of the, of the general characteristics of the time, so that we'll at least know we shouldn't be fooling around if we're out of Christ. We shouldn't be fooling around if we have not yet given our hearts and our lives to Christ. But we don't know, no human being knows the exact time that Jesus will return in the, in the full glory of what the Bible describes as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the wonderful counsel of the mighty God, the everlasting Savior, the Almighty, the Prince of Peace. He's coming someday in that way. And I believe that when he does, he will consummate the age. And everything that's temporal will become, will just perish. The scripture says that this whole, this whole universe will someday just go up in a conflagration, a perishing of that which is, which is merely material, a perishing of that which is temporal as distinguished from eternal. And yet God will then usher in the permanence of the new heavens and the new earth that the book of the Revelation speaks about, and the eternal kingdom of God will, that will be forever and ever and ever. And those who belong to him through faith, those who have been redeemed by the shed blood of the, of the Lord, uh, and who have appropriated that shed blood to themselves by their personal repentance and faith will spend eternity in their own glorified form, having been resurrected from the dead if they died beforehand, and having been translated if they're living when those events take place, and raptured into a translated form. I believe all of that, I believe it to the bottom of my toenail. And those toenails are about 76 inches away from the top of my head. Now, I said all of that to say, that I believe the Bible reveals that the line that God started with Abraham and brought all the way down through the annals of time to a point, thank you, to a point where a, an humble Jewish maiden, Shaith, I believe in the virgin birth of Christ, I do not believe in Mary as an aggrandized human being who is somehow uh, divine herself, I do not believe that. I believe the only divine person who ever walked the face of this earth was Jesus the Christ. And I believe that his divinity is co-equal with that of God the Father because he is God the Father in a revealed human earthly uh, uh, a time in, or, or era in his existence. Uh, I can't separate the difference between uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and not see them as distinct personalities and yet not believe that they're three gods. I don't believe in three gods. I'm not a polytheist. I am a, I'm a, I'm a monotheist, and I believe that somehow... Uh, it doesn't bother me that my finite mind, which is the opposite of an infinite mind, my finite mind cannot comprehend 
such an infinite concept as the triune nature of God, nor can it uh, comprehend the virgin birth of Christ, nor can it comprehend uh, many of the other mysteries that the Bible teaches us that are beyond the ken of uh, human understanding. Human beliefs, we can believe them, but human understanding just can't necessarily uh, comprehend all the details of those great mysteries. So I believe that Jesus, in the flesh, insofar as his fleshly person is concerned, came down from a line of humanity that began with Abraham and ended with Mary in Bethlehem that night, almost 2,000 years ago. Now, I don't see anything in the scripture that teaches me that that line that I just described is anything other than a line called Hebrew, a line called Jew, a line called Israel, a line called uh, the seed of Abraham, a line called uh, the, uh, the fruit of, of Jacob in, in, in the sense of the, of the inheritance, a line called a seed of David, a line called uh, from the tribe of Judah, of the 12 tribes that Jacob sponsored and, and, and progenitor. So I, I, I base my belief that Jesus is a Jew on the scripture that details that line. I'd like to share some of those passages with you. In uh, the gospel account by Luke, in the first chapter, we read this in verses 26 and 27 and some other selected verses following that. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. That's where he was, that's where he was from, although he was born in Bethlehem. But his mother Mary and, and her espoused uh, person, Joseph, they had not yet consummated their marriage physically. She was still a virgin, though they had, a, they had what in those days was tantamount to a contract of marriage. They already belonged to one another and pledged their, their, their troth to one another, but they had not consummated the marriage sexually or physically. And she was indeed a virgin, according to the scripture. And the angel of God, a messenger of God, uh, angelic beings are creatures. They're creatures of God. They're not divine. They're simply creatures not of this realm, not of this world. They're different from us. We're creatures called, homo, called uh, uh, human beings. Thank you. But uh, this angel, this messenger of God, comes to Mary in a city in the province of Galilee, the city called Nazareth, and verse 27 says this, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And elsewhere in scripture we find that Mary also is of the lineage of David. So both Joseph, who was not Jesus' physical sire, don't misunderstand me on that point, that would destroy the doctrine of the virgin birth, and the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible simply teaches that Joseph was her consort as it was, but not having yet consummated their marriage. But both Joseph and Mary descend from the line of David. So in that sense, at least the reputational father of Jesus, because he had the reputation of being the father of that, of that family, Joseph did, was of the household of David. And then the scripture goes on to say, and the angel came unto her and said, Hail, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And then further on down, the angel said in verse 30, uh, Don't fear, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And Jesus is our English transliteration of the word, the name, but the name Yahshua in Hebrew is literally a word, a name which means Savior. So Jesus, the very name Jesus refers to his saving work, to his atoning work for sin. And so it, it, she was instructed, you shall, call, you shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Highest is a reference to God Almighty, so the scripture is plain. He shall be uh, called the Son of God, the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his forefather David. Now that doesn't mean a temporal throne. David is simply symbolic of a throne which represents the position of the Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. But he comes in the type of a previous King of Israel named David. And then the scripture goes on to say, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob. House of Jacob is Israel. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. You see, those are the words of perpetuity. Those are the words of eternality. Those are not words of, of having a termination in history or a termination on the things of this earth. So the, these are descriptions of the marvelous earth, uh, uh, heavenly kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
All of this is prophesied before Mary even conceived and, 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 and nurtured him and then bore him. And then it goes on to say Mary was perplexed about uh, how this could be because she had not had any relations with a man. And verse 35 says, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the highest, that's the power of God, shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born from you shall be called the Son of God. And then the scripture goes on in that first chapter of Luke uh, to talk about the, the, these uh, great things regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. In verses uh, 67 and following, we read this in the first chapter of Luke. Uh, this is the father of, of John the Baptist who was a child born six months previous to Jesus' birth by a cousin of Mary. And that father was named Zacharias, and it says, And his father, meaning John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the household of his servant David. That's simply another reference to the Davidic lineage of the ethnic background of Jesus as a human being in the flesh. His fleshly person is from the line of David. And then he goes on to say things about the, the, the uh, which clearly shows that he's the Son of God, that he's divine. And verse 73 in that passage uh, refers to the oath which God had sworn to the, uh, their forefather Abraham, showing the beginning of that, of that line. Then I would uh, commend to you in the second chapter of Luke. Uh, verse 4 in the second chapter says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judea and to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, uh, because he was of the household and the lineage of David. There were circumstances, political as they were in that day, that led the family of Mary and Joseph, who by Mary by then being pregnant, uh, with, the, uh, with this uh, fetus, which was the Son of God. And I might say, uh, well, no, I won't say it. That's, uh, that's an aside. But in any event, uh, they led them from, uh, they, they were led from the town of, of Nazareth, their hometown, to Bethlehem, the city of David, for tax purposes. And that's where Jesus happened to be born. All of that's consistent with Scripture. Uh, in Micah, the Old Testament book, it specifically prophesies that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And, and the book of Matthew, uh, and, and books of Matthew and Luke in the New Testament uh, record that that was in fact the case. Then uh, in the 10th and 11th verses of that uh, second chapter of Luke, uh, the scripture says, for, both, for unto you is born this day, this is when the angels made their announcement to the shepherds who were in the field, unto you is born this day in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Jesus is his name. Christ is who he was. The word Christ is uh, our English word from the Greek word Christos, which literally means the anointed, the anointed of God. Just as Messiah is uh, the Hebrew word for anointed, so Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. They simply mean that Jesus by name, Emmanuel by name, is the Messiah, the anointed of God, and his anointing is for this primary purpose of being the Savior of human beings. The, the Savior whom God provided in order that human beings who are sinners by nature and sinners by practice would not have to remain under the condemnation of their sins, but, had, but, but, but by repentance and faith could have uh, an eternal life with God if they put their faith and trust in the one whom God sent to do the atonement for their sins. And so then the scripture goes on. In the 21st verse of this second chapter of Luke, it refers to the fact that after eight days following his birth, uh, his parents took him to the temple for the rite of circumcision, which Jews uh, had uh, as part of their uh, identity. And it says that the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named by the angel before he had even been conceived in the womb. And in the Matthew account, you know, the angel even told Mary that his name would be also Emmanuel, which means God with us, which is a reference to the fact that God has, has descended. He is, from the transcendence of the heavenly realm, God has descended in the person of the Christ uh, to the world and tabernacled among us, tented among us, lived among us, abided among us, which shows that though God is transcendent, he is also imminent. Though he's far away in an eternal sense, he's very close in a temporal sense, in a human sense. And, and Jesus Christ is, 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 is the way in which God reveals those truths to human beings. Human beings need not feel any estrangement from Christ. Human beings should not feel, who are, who are believers, human beings who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ should not feel any estrangement from God, regardless of the color of his skin, 
regardless of where he's from. I'm here to deal with the fact that I believe strongly, because the Bible says so in my opinion, that he was not from Africa, that he was from Asia Minor, and I believe that he was not a black person, that he was uh, a Jew, and Jews were not, are not shown in the scripture to be black persons. But I do believe that it doesn't really matter what his skin color was, or where he was, uh, where he was uh, from in, in, a, in a geographic sense, so long as we understand he is the divine son of God, and so long as we understand that he has done, and he is the only one who has done, and the only one who can do the work of atonement and make it possible for sinners to be saved. And that's the abiding hope that I have. I believe that when I die, no matter what the circumstances, I believe that I will go to heaven. Not because I'm good, and not because I'm, uh, I, I'm worth it, and not because I'm worthy of it, and not because I deserve it, because I don't believe that I deserve it or am worthy of it. But I believe that I'll go purely and simply because the grace of God has said that if any sinner repents of his sin and trusts in God's provision for his salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be saved. Emphatically will be saved. And I'm, I'm, I'm banking my eternal destiny on the validity and the veracity of that promise of God that I read from the Word of God. And 40 years ago, I put my faith and trust in Jesus as my Savior when I was just a young law student at LSU. And I haven't changed my mind over these years. In fact, as the years have passed, I've become more and more confirmed in my belief and in my hope for eternal life. And it's a hope not in the sense that I have any doubt about it. It's a hope only in the sense that it hasn't materialized yet and won't materialize until either I die and go to be with the Lord in spirit or am translated if the Lord returns before I die and I'm glorified and taken up into heaven in that way as the Bible declares. Now, the scripture also has many other passages that I would like to share with you. In the first chapter of Matthew, you have uh, the genealogy of Joseph. And that genealogy plainly shows uh, that it comes all the way down. Uh, the very first verse in Matthew 1 says, The book of the generation, the generations, which, uh, you know, the word G-E-N, genera, uh, comes from a root which means origin, which means beginning. The book of Genesis means the beginnings of many things revealed to us in the book of Genesis. Genetic refers to human, uh, to the beginning of human nature in the sense of uh, that which makes us what we are as individual human beings, and, and on and on. Generator means something which gives a beginning, a thrust, to energy, a power, uh, and so forth. But anyhow, it says the book of the generation of Jesus, generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That doesn't mean he's literally a physical son of David or literally a physical son of Abraham, but it's just a way of, of leaping the, the gaps and saying Jesus all the way through a line that has David somewhere in the middle of it and goes up to Abraham. And in Luke's account of the genealogy of Mary, uh, in the third chapter of Luke, you have something similar, but it runs all the way from Adam down to Jesus. Uh, so we have two genealogies, one of which takes you through the line of the Jews and the other which takes you through the humanity that also includes that line of the Jews. The Luke genealogy is, is broader and, and more extensive than the Matthew genealogy, but the portion of the Luke genealogy that deals with the line from Abraham is still the Jewish line. And uh, so Jesus comes through that means. I don't, uh, as, as a Bible believer, I accept that. And uh, so let me move now to some other things. In Romans, the first chapter, the verses 3 and 4, uh, the scripture says, well, just let me read it with one. Paul, his introductory work, the Apostle Paul. He says, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, meaning God's son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So the scripture again confirms that Jesus' earthly heritage is that from the seed of David, comes from David. And the Old Testament had prophesied this. In Isaiah 11, 1, I won't take the time to read it. In Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, uh, the scripture makes it plain that Jesus is uh, of the household of David, that Jesus as the Messiah was to come through the throne of David and, and in fact be uh, symbolically the throne of David was the symbol of the throne of the Almighty God in his heavenly realm uh, which the Christ Jesus uh, occupied. And then uh, further there are passages of scripture for example Hebrews 7:14, uh, which says 
for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood, simply meaning that the tribe of Judah was not the priestly tribe. The tribe of Levi was the priestly tribe among the Jews, among the twelve sons of Jacob, Jacob being Israel. But Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah, and both of the genealogies show this. And so he is a Jew from the, from the loins of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, and then through Judah, uh, one, of the, one of the twelve sons of uh, Jacob, and on down the line through the descendants of Judah, uh, which the Bible clearly demarcates. I don't have time to read those, all those names, but uh, they are there in the Bible, and the Bible plainly declares that line. Then, in the book of the Revelation, in the fifth chapter, verses five and six, say this, and one of the elders says to me, this is John the Apostle on the island of Patmos for the decline of his life, receiving certain revealed visions from God, which he then writes under divine inspiration into the book of the Revelation. And he says, one of the elders said to me, don't weep, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood the Lamb, capital L on Lamb, as it had been slain, having seen, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, that God sent forth into all the earth. And then the book goes on to describe in verses 9 through 13 that the Lamb clearly is the crucified Christ. Worthy is the Lamb, says the scripture. And it says that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, meaning that God had the plan of salvation which involved himself becoming the sacrifice for the sins of man in order to make atonement for the sins of man, rather than man being able to atone for his own sins, either through his good works or through his, his self-punishment. Man can't atone for his own sins. Salvation, as I read and understand the Word of God, is purely and simply and totally by the divine grace of God. Were it not for God's grace, there would be no salvation. But praise God, in His grace, He has provided a way that all human beings can follow. I believe that the Scripture shows, to my satisfaction in any event, that after the flood, I believe in a universal flood, I believe that the flood at the time of Noah covered the earth. I believe that, it, that all human beings except the eight persons who were in the ark, Noah and his wife, his three sons and their respective wives, were all perished in the flood. So that the only human beings that repopulated the earth after the flood were the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the scripture gives a lot of details in the ninth, the 10th, and the 11th chapters of Genesis, all of which I believe. I don't take those three chapters of Genesis as allegorical. I don't take them as mythical. I take them as, as, as actual truth from God to explain to us the origins of things. And in those passages of, uh, 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 in those chapters, the scripture makes it plain, I believe, that of the three sons of Noah, when God finally confused the languages at the Tower of Babel incident and, and scattered them geographically, because prior to that time they all were in the, in, in the place on the, on the face of this earth where civilization arose. The Bible says that the, the ark came to, came to rest uh, upon Mount Ararat, and that's somewhere in the, in the vicinity of what is now Turkey in the world, in, uh, in, the, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Asian continent, the Asia Minor continent as we call it today. And the, the whole civilization in the next generations uh, that came forth from these uh, children until the time of the Tower of Babel incident that's described in the scriptures uh, centered in that area. But God, because of the circumstances of the Tower of Babel and what it represented and what it meant, rebellion against God by human beings, God then scattered them and also confused the tongues, which means they didn't have any longer a single language. They had individual languages in the various places where they went. And as you track through the table of nations in the 10th chapter of Genesis, I believe, uh, and I'm not the only one who believes this, a lot of people who are in disciplines, in educational disciplines that I'm not an expert in, uh, who believe that uh, it can be shown that the following are some of the peoples, not all of the peoples, but some of the peoples, ancient peoples, who descended from Shem, one of the sons of Noah, uh, the, the Jews, there's no question but that the Jews descend from Shem. The, uh, the genealogies in Matthew and Luke show this clearly. 
Uh, but Jews, Arabs, Syrians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians are all people who uh, are the nations and the peoples who seem to have descended from Shem. Uh, Japheth uh, seems to have as, its, as his descendants those who ended up occupying the part of the world that we call Indochina in India and oh, I mean Indo-Europe, in India and all of the uh, northern countries in Europe, uh, uh, Russia, uh, Denmark, uh, England, Italy. Spain, France, Germany, all of those areas, Scandinavian countries. The scriptures in the table of nations uh, in the 10th chapter of Genesis seem to me to show that the descendants of Ham ended up being the following peoples. And there's nothing denigrating about these people. Some of these peoples had great civilizations and, and were great nations, great empires. The Egyptians, the, uh, the Sumerians, uh, the Ethiopians, Africans, Phoenicians, Mongols, Orientals, Hittites, all the Canaanite nations that ended up inhabiting uh, the promised land that God had given to, uh, to Abraham and that after the exodus under Moses out of Egypt, out of the Egyptian bondage, where the Israelites spent 400 years in that bondage, they had to come back and cross over into Canaan and reestablish themselves in that promised land under the leadership of Joshua and Caleb. And they had to defeat the Canaanites. They had to get rid of the Canaanites, move them out of the area in order that they could be where God intended for them to be from the first place. But all those Canaanite nations uh, seemingly are descendants of Ham. I think uh, the scriptures show that American Indians and all the South Sea Islanders are descendants of Ham. Now, what does that mean? It simply means that I believe since Jesus descends from Shem, one of the three sons of Noah, and not from Japheth, and not from Ham, and since the, the, the descendants of Ham seem to be the majority of the people of peoples of the world who are black in their, in their skin pigmentation, and black with some racial characteristics in that regard, Jesus did not descend from that line. That's why I say that Jesus is a Jew, and as a Jew, he's not a black. And because he was, he's from Nazareth, and Bethlehem, and Palestine, He's not from Africa. He's from a portion of the world that was not regarded as part of the continent of Africa. He's from a portion of the world that's regarded as part of the continent of Asia Minor. I might be a little bit short of my 45 minutes, but that's all I have to say in the opening. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers and sisters, I present to you Minister and Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. giving honor to a black god and to his precious sweet son, black Jesus, and to the precious black Holy Ghost, I am honored to have this opportunity to debate, debate this very important debate topic. Attorney Bryan has chosen the resolution that resolves Jesus was a Jew and was not of African art. Let's go after that because white people do love. We have a history during our 400 years here in America. 
of the lies of the white man. The white man who has set up a racist doctrine to establish his position of white supremacy all over the face of the planet Earth. And so, since Attorney Bryan has started off by saying that, let's look at his comments here, has started off by saying I don't plan to use rhetoric, not here to argue the point, not competent to debate on matters of the Quran. I promise you I won't use the Quran. But he says he does not intend to argue the point, then he should not have put it in the time picayune if he didn't want an argument. He says tonight he wants to base much of his argument or all of his argument on the Bible, on what he calls the Holy Bible. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan teach us that holy means pure, unmixed, undiluted, and untampered with in any form. Now we need to see if the book that the lawyer here, the lying lawyer, the book that he is using is a pure book, an unmixed, undiluted, and untampered with book. And if you're going to use the Holy Bible, Attorney Brian, what Holy Bible are you going to use? Are you going to use the Schofield verse? Are you going to use the Phillips verse? Are you going to use the Jewish verse? Are you going to use the New World Translation, the Jerusalem Bible? What Bible, the Catholic Bible, what Bible are you going to use? That's the question here tonight. One Bible has 66 chapters in them. 66 books in the Bible. I don't want you to miss that. One Bible has 66 books in the Bible. Another Bible has 72 books in the Bible. What Bible are you going to use here tonight to convince this audience of your argument? We've even got what is called the forgotten books of the Bible. We've even got what is called the lost books of the Bible. Hell, who lost it? And why did you lose it? That's the question here tonight. You're going to use the Bible. He wants to come from the second chapter of Timothy, the third, the second, second Timothy, the third chapter, and the 16th verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But let's take a look at that. Say that the first five books of the Bible are the first five books of Moses. Yet in the first five books of the Bible, Moses talks about his own funeral and his own death and burial. I ask the question, how could Moses know about his death, his funeral, and know all about the circumstances and details surrounding his burial? Let us look at the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Are you with me? I intend to prove here tonight that Jesus of the Bible was and is a black African. I intend to prove here tonight that Attorney Bryan is a liar and the representative of a lying race of people who have lied to us for the past 400 years. Before we go to the Revised Standard Version, the King James Version. Now James, according to history, was a sister. James was a homosexual. James was switching all over Europe. James was in love with men in the kingdom that the women were in love with and had arguments and fights many times over the men in the kingdom. God does not name a holy book after his sister. The very book of the Bible condemns homosexuality and bagging around. But James, who was the king of that time, yes, it's authorized by him because he was the king. I wonder was James inspired of God? Says this is the Old and New Testament translated out of the original tongue. Let's stop for a minute there. They tell you it was translated out of the original tongue. 
I'm here to tell you tonight from the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan that you black man and you black woman that you are the original man and the original woman and so they are telling you that they translated it out of your language took it out of your tongue so that they could dupe you, so that they could fool you, so that they could trick you and have you bow down to a blonde hair, pale skin, buttermilk complexion, blue eyed, pecker wood looking teeth. <laughs> this trucker is not Jesus. This is not Jesus. This is nothing but a stringy hair, blue eyed, green eyed, sometimes straight hair, buttermilk complexion white man. This is the white man, as the Bible says, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is the God, deceiving all of the nations. And so everything that is white is all right. He teaches us that angel food cake is white and devil food cake is black. He teaches us that we wear white to weddings and we wear black to funerals. He says, if I know something on you, I blackmail you. If I want to put you out of the church, I blackball you. Ajax goes through the community cleaning like a white tornado. He says, it's not good to lie, buddy. But if you must tell a lie, guy, it's all right if you tell a little white lie. We can't even go into the pool hall or the billiard room for a family game without racism staring us in the face, a shiny white ball on the table, knocking the hell out of the black, the brown, the red, and the yellow balls on the table. And the worst ball on the table is the black ball or the eight ball. This is not Jesus, it's a peck of wood, a pecker. He's not Jesus. And you should take him down from your wall. Take him down from your wall. Jesus is a black man. Well, the lying lawyer said, well, I, he came in here, punk it out. Well, I, 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 am not here to so and so, and I, 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 I didn't, we're not impressed by that. You didn't expect anybody to call you on it. That's why you put it in the Times Picayune. But this is a new black man today, and a new black woman today. Because one of his contentions is that Jesus is a Jew. Jesus is a Jew. Well, I don't have no problem with that, lawyer. Jesus was a Jew. But now the question is, were the Jews black like me, or were the Jews white like you? That's the question. Don't tell me nothing about Shamir and Pagan and the rest of them over there in the illegitimate criminal, criminal settler colony that is called Israel today. These are not the true Jews. These are a train of white people who have crawled out of the caves and hills of Europe and who have driven us from the centers of power in what they call the Middle East. For years the white man lied to us and told us that Egypt was not even in Africa. Hell, we're looking at it right on the map. And this cracker told us, that's what I said, told us that it was not in Africa. Egypt is indeed in Africa. And at one time, that was what was called the kingdom of Egypt. At another time, that was what was called the kingdom of Ethiopia. Now, we need to look at this. Egypt, according to the Greek, represents a term in its etymological root, agaptos, which means the land of the black. But the true name for Egypt in the hieroglyphics of the holy writings of the Medunetur is Kemet. And Kemet means black. Ethiopia, or Ethiopia means the land of the black and the burnt skin. Herodotus, his own white historian, 
told him that the Egyptians were a jet black people and that the Jews of that area were a jet black people. But now let's look at it even further than that. The area that is called the Middle East. Quiet as it kept. Ain't the Middle East at all. The area that is called the Middle East is really Northeast Africa, separated from the mainland of Africa by a white man named Dick called the Suez Canal. All of that represented the empire of Ethiopia at one time, or Egypt at one time. And they drove us from the centers of power, and all of those areas changed from black to brown to white. Now, as we look at this a little more carefully, we will find that at the beginning, all of the gods or deities were depicted as black. He mentioned Luke. He started off with Luke. We need to take a look at Luke and see what we can find on Luke. As regards the black Christ as virgin, Romain Roman, a noted white French writer, says, why are the majority of the virgins that are revered in celebrated pilgrimages black? He goes on to talk about Switzerland, Zurich. He goes on to talk about Spain. He talks about Poland. He talks with other scholars and talks and speaks of Russia, of Italy where all of the black Madonnas were to just that. They were black, and they had a black baby in their arms. And you can go to this very day all over Europe and find a black Mary and a black Jesus. You saw the Pope in Life magazine bowing down and kneeling down making his prayer in front of a black Mary and in a black Jesus in front of a black Jesus. The shrine of Chester College go to Russia and buy the thing. All over Europe, white people believed in a black Mary and a black Jesus. Tradition says that it was St. Luke who, who knew personally the mother of Jesus Christ and carved with his own hand the majority of those black birds and virgins, and they were spread all over Europe. Apollo was black. Did you know that the theater in New York City is named for a black god? Apollo, Zeus was black. Krishna means black. Buddha was black. All of the gods of the known black and white world were black until something very significant happened. One white man by the name of Pope Julius II. Pope Julius II commissioned an old, no good white man named Michelangelo. And Michelangelo, Michelangelo, he didn't get his mama, but he got his uncle, his aunt, and his cousin and his uncle and aunt's baby. In the Browder file, we find this, he took his uncle to pose for Adam and painted the picture. He got his aunt to pose for Eve and painted the picture. He got his cousin to pose for Jesus and painted the picture, and took the baby of his uncle and aunt to pose for the baby Jesus. Now, wait a minute, let's look at this thing a little further. The lawyer here, the liar here, says that Jesus was a Jew and that he leaves it at that. I say he was a Jew and that the true Jew is a black Jew. Josephus, the first century foremost historian among the so-called Jews. Josephus, the first century foremost scholar among the Jews. Let us see what a so-called Jewish historian has to say about Jew Jesus himself. Now the lawyer wasn't there, is that right? 
I wasn't there, is that right? But Josephus, the historian of the first century AD, has this to say. He describes Jesus as a man of simple appearance, mature age, black skin, little hat, four and a half to five feet tall, with a long face and an underdeveloped beard. He goes on to say that the early Christians, including Tertullian and St. Augustine, accepted this view as the proper description of Jesus. But now let's go a little further. In the book, Messiah Christ, by another so-called Jew, since this thing seems to be all about Jews, that's the way you're going to try to duck out of this thing, as to whether he was black or white, you're going to throw a pair and try to go Jew on him. In his book, The Messiah Christ, page 411, 421, and 442, a white man just like the lion lawyer. Reporting on Josephus, he says, of the first century Jewish historian, he says, the paintings of Jesus after the church was allowed to come out into the open and was not banned anymore, that the early church decided that it was offensive to the believing early Christians, white people, and their Hellenistic ideas. And so the image of Jesus, the white man, just like the lion lawyer is. Aura Eisler, speaking on what the first century Jewish historian Josephus has told us, he said they felt that in having nephi hat, black skin, that this was offensive to the white church. And so they decided to make him six feet tall. Well groomed, Eichler said, handsome, venerable, have a beautiful mouth, a full copious beard, and check this out, and blue eyes. Let's go a little further. Pichot, another white man, French white man, a white man like the lion lawyer here. In his book, The Research History of the Personage, the Personality, Jesus the Christ, page 2, 1829, he says nothing remains authentic of the exterior appearance of Christ. And he goes on to say how the church, the white folks of that era, changed all of the pictures upon the turn of that particular period and era with Michelangelo coming on the scene, that nothing remains authentic of the exterior appearance of Jesus. Jesus, whenever he was depicted, he was jet black. He was a blue black man. The Bible in the book of Revelation, I don't know if uh, Attorney Brian has read it or not, and in the book of Daniel, says that Jesus would be a man with hair like lamb wool. That nappy stuff. You know how yours used to be nappy before you got your scary curtain. How yours used to be nappy before you got your temporary permit and it's and it died and it laid it to the side. Revelation says, and Daniel says, he would have hair like lamb wool. His feet would be like pure grass or fine grass as though it had been burnt in an oak. Revelation teaches us and Daniel teaches us that Jesus would be a black man. His mother would be black. According to the white scholars that we have cited, his mother was black and Jesus was black. We don't argue over him being a Jew. We just know that the Jew that's over there in Israel, as they call it today, is not the true Jew. That the true Hebrew, the true Jew, is a black Jew. Let's look at it a little further. It said he would have feet as though it had been burned in an oak. It would be like bronze or fine brass as though it had been burnt in an oak. Looks like this fella got black feet. 
Look like he got black feet to you. Look like he's been burning an oven. I'm sorry to tell you, Attorney Bryant, but we can't go for the hype anymore. We don't believe the hype. Then they give us a picture with 13 crackers sitting at the table. Take these pecker words off of your wall. 13 white folks sitting at the table. God is no respect of person. Where's the Chinese at the table? Where's the Japanese at the table? Where's the black African at the table? Where's the woman at the table? No wonder you're hungry in New Orleans. You can see we didn't get nothing to eat that day. If we were there at all, we must have been in the kitchen. I'm sorry, we cannot eat. Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan came to the 
city of New Orleans and made it new for black people. And 9,000 black people came out to hear this mighty man from God. He was so enraged by this. He went to his typewriter. He was driven by the rage in him to write this racist article. Let me read what the cracker wrote. No good pastor. Jamie, pastor is not cursing. Pastor is an illegitimate child. And the white man is an illegitimate child in the family of God Almighty. He's the number one murderer, the number one liar, the number one enslaver and colonizer. I'm picking you. Let's look at it. Jesus not of African origin. Jesus was not black, racially a Negro, nor was he of African origin. Would you please bring that black board out so I can write on it with some white chalk? He said the very contrary is taught by the Imani people. According to your August 18th article, such teaching is, is entirely error. It evidently is based on Imani's equally incorrect Bible study, which cites no supporting passage and a fallacious conclusion from the fact that Jesus was a Semitic person. Now let's stop for a minute and deal with this curse of hand. He hooks us up in the article in his letter to the editor, which being Ham's children, and that we have been cursed. It's the same argument that the no-good cracker uses down in South Africa to oppress our people in South Africa. It's the same argument that David and Duke and the rest of the crazy crackers of the Ku Klux Klan and the others who are in the White House, you should have known it was the white folks, they named it the White House. It's the same argument that they use from the scripture, that you are the descendants of Ham, and you have been cursed because you are descended of hell. You and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, the premier leader of the black movement and the liberation and salvation of the black nation. Let's look at it. Thank you, man. Let's look at it and look at it very carefully. Here. I want to hold that point and get back into this revised standard version that I keep using as a cock here. I'm gonna go on and pull the trigger. The preface, the what? The preface to the revised standard version Bible. Let's listen to it, you ready? The King James Version has with good reason been termed the noblest monument of English prose. Its revisers in 1881 expressed admiration for its simplicity, its dignity, its power, its happy terms of expression, the music of its cadences, and the felicities of its rhythm. It enters as no other book has into the making of the personal character and the public institutions of the English-speaking people. We owe to it an incalculable debt. Yet, the King James Version has grave defects. By the middle of the 19th century, the development of biblical studies and the discovery of many manuscripts were an more ancient than those upon which the King James Version was based, made it manifest that these defects in the King James Bible are so many and so serious. So what? So many and so serious as to call for revision of the English translation. The white scholars go on to say that there are over 100,000 contradictions in the Old Testament alone. And white scholars and theologians just recently met a few months ago, and they determined that over 70% of the New Testament that is attributed to Jesus, that Jesus didn't even say. Let's look at some of the contradictions. There's one right there. (laughs) 
Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter, in the ninth verse, Jehoiakim, the king of Jerusalem, was eight years old when he began to reign in Jerusalem. How old was he? Second Kings 24 and 8. Jeho Jehoiakim, the king of Jerusalem, was 18 years old when he began to reign in Jerusalem. Was he eight or was he 18? Second Chronicles 22 and 2. 40 and 2 years old was uh, Isaiah when he began to reign. Second Kings 8 and 26. 2 and 20 years old was uh, Isaiah when he began to reign. Was he 42 or was he 22? Let's go on a little further. God is seen and heard. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my backbone. Exodus 33 and 22. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face, as he speak to him, face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. Exodus 33 and 11. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Genesis 3, 9 through 10. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Genesis 20, the 32nd chapter and the 30th verse. In the year of King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, I saw the Lord, sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Isaiah the 6th chapter and the first verse. Now let's see what the rest of the Bible got to say. Since he's facing his argument on a Bible that's an infallible book, on a book that has been inspired by the men of God, and that God would not let anything happen to the book, and that the white man is not so slick and so quick that he wouldn't even try to fool God. Let's see. All of these scriptures say God can be seen and that he can be heard. Let's see. No man has seen God at any time. John 1 and 18. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. John 5 and 37. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall be no man see me and live. Exodus 33 and 20. Whom no man has seen, nor can see. 1 Timothy 6 and 16. Those are serious contradictions here to me. Professor Churchwood, in his work, Origin and Evolution of Religion, and St. Augustine, we'll touch St. Augustine first. Professor Churchwood, in Origin and Evolution of Religion, holds that the African Pygmies and the Negroes were the real originators of the Christian religion. J.A. Rogers also tells Professor J.A. Rogers in Sex and Race. St. Augustine himself says, what is now called the Christian religion has existed among the ancients long before and was not absent from the beginning of the human race until Christ came into flesh, from which time the true religion, which existed already begun, became known as Christianity. Let's go through a few others here. Count C.F. Bowles, another white man in his book, Ruins of Empire, wrote, Professor Preston, the famous Egyptologist, maintains that the Ethiopians are the first to give religious thought and aspiration to the world. The Ten Commandments come from the 147 declarations of innocence of Maya called the 147 negative confessions. I have not committed sin. I have not coveted my neighbor's wife. I have not killed. I have not stolen. They took them from there. He spoke of innocence. You can find the Genesis story of the Bible taking 10,000 years before the Genesis story of the Bible in the holy city of Abydos on the walls in the hieroglyphics of the Mesonetta in the city of, in the sacred temple of Tetiwan in Northeast Africa today. You can find the Ten Commandments there among the 147 in the hieroglyphics of ancient Africa or ancient Egypt. This record didn't know what the hell he was talking about, and he didn't know what he was walking into.
Professor Yusuf bin Yassin and a Jew says the world's first religious principles were substantiated and that all the moral forces and principles come out of that. Sir Godfrey Higgins, Sir James Fraser, Albert Churchwood, Gerald Massey in his book of the beginning, second book, two volumes, 1930, Egypt, the light of the world. As we go on to look at Professor George G.M. James, Professor John G. Jackson, Dr. John Henry Clark, as we look at all of them, Anacalypsis, the Golden Vine, Origin and Evolution of Religion, all of them say that Jesus was a black man and was always depicted as a black baby with a black mother, coming from Isis or Aset in ancient Africa, and her baby, uh, Horus or Heru. All of this comes from you, black man and woman. All of these Bibles, I really didn't know which one because when you got a Bible that's got missing books and I don't know how he could say it was inspired, they met at the Council of Gambia and they met at the Nicene Conference. They held a series of Nicene Conferences and at those conferences they decided that Jesus would be white, he would be tall, he would have blonde hair and blue eyes because the white man does not want to say and in his secret circles that Jesus, the Son of God, is a black man from among us. They preach all of this. Jesus is coming back. I want you out there in radio to draw near your radio. Jesus is coming back. If Oral Roberts was standing at the bullpen, if old No Good Jimmy Swaggart was standing there, if, uh, what's his name, Billy Graham, or uh, if uh, the man over the immoral majority, Falwell down in Lynchburg, if Jesus walked into the church and said, I'm black and I'm black, church would be out there. I'm black and I'm black, church would be out there. The church, the white man's church, the white man's church sanctions slavery, the Catholic church owns slavery. The empire was built on the back of your and my forefathers and mothers. He wonders why we have no respect for the red, the white, and the blue. It's because George Washington owns slaves. Thomas Jefferson owns slaves. They stole their own babies that they had. Great and our great great grandmothers. They stole them in the slavery for a bag of molasses and syrup. Why does this cracker wonder why we laugh when he sits at a table? The red, the white, and the blue. Oh, I'm so thankful to God for this white man right here to give you an opportunity tonight to explore a question that we should have explored a long time ago. He's a daredevil, and we needed a daredevil to come out front. The rest of the devils are sneaking and hiding somewhere in the office.
I don't do it, never have done it. So I don't stand for that. If others do, and that's the result of it down there, those broken pieces on the floor, that's another matter. That had nothing to do with what I was here for tonight. Matter of which Bible? I have a King James translation. I have about 15 other translations in my library. I don't, I don't agree with all of the translations. In fact, I'm a very conservative theologian. My theology is very conservative. And I don't believe that all of the translations of the Bible that are out on the market are faithful to the, to the original uh, autographs. I realize none of the original autographs are intact. Nobody has them. But we have certainly an abundance of manuscripts, both ancient and less than ancient, which attest to the, to the biblical text that we have, both the Hebrew text in the Old Testament and the Greek text in the New Testament. And I'm satisfied that the King James translation is a reasonably accurate translation, that there may be some things in the, in the translation that are, that are not exactly correct. That's a matter of opinion. That's a matter of discernment. But I do not subscribe to some of the, especially some of the, the versions of the Bible that he was referring to. I don't, I, don't, I don't even like the Revised Standard Version of 1946 because I think it's very liberal in its theology. I think it's liberal in its, in its view of Scripture. I think it's liberal in, in its view of the divinity of Christ. And I, as a conservative Bible student, uh, don't agree with it at all. Uh, some of those other versions, I don't vouch for them. Uh, to parade out all these other versions is simply to say, yes, there are a lot of Christians in the world that have different Bible translations that they put great stock in, but that has nothing to do with me, and it has nothing to do with anything I said in my opening presentation. So it really wasn't a relevant uh, uh, rebuttal. He took a lot of liberties with the truth in one respect. He brought my article that appeared in the uh, in Picayune. I didn't write it as an article. I wrote it as a letter. The Picayune edited out some of what I said. I grant you that the Picayune didn't add anything that I didn't say. It simply cut out a lot of what I did say in my letter. But I'll tell you one thing you won't find in either the article or my letter, which he made much of, and that's his business of the ham curse. I didn't say anything about the ham curse in my letter to the editor. And he took great liberties with the truth in imputing that to me and trying to let you believe that I said that. I did not say that. So he wasn't truthful when he told you that I did say that. In point of fact, the Bible doesn't say anything about Ham being cursed. That passage happens to be in the ninth chapter of Genesis. At verses 25 and following. And I'll just read them to you. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Cursed is Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. The Bible says nothing whatever about God cursing Ham. To the contrary, it makes it very explicit that God cursed Canaan, who was the youngest son of Ham. And it doesn't tell you exactly what the curse is. It, what it says is he shall be a servant of servants, and the next two verses tend to explain that. They say that the other two sons of Noah, the brothers of, Shem, uh, of Ham, the uncles of Canaan, are Shem and Japheth. And it says, Shem shall be blessed of God in a certain way, and Canaan shall be his servant. And then it says, and Japheth shall enlarge his tent, which is a metaphoric mean, uh, uh, idiom, which simply means he will be enlarged in terms of, his, of, of the scope of his, uh, of his population, but he'll also have a close contour with his brother's uh, descendants, uh, those of, uh, of Shem. But it then says, Canaan shall be his servant. Well, what does that mean? Bible scholars have differed over what it means. But at least one interpretation is that Ham will have a, not Ham, but Canaan, and, and Canaan's descendants will have a position of servitude to the descendants of both Shem and Japheth. And the descendants of Shem are, and do include, the Jews. And there are verses in the Bible that plainly show that such uh, uh, servitude was involved. For example, in uh, Joshua, the 8th chapter, In Joshua, the ninth chapter, the first verse describes the people about whom the ninth chapter is written. And it refers to the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and all of those who were collectively the, the descendants of Canaan. And then in verse 23, the Bible says, 
Now therefore you, meaning the descendants of Canaan, are cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondsmen, bond servants, and hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. Now that simply means that there were descendants of Canaan who ended up being in servitude to the Jews. And the Jews did have many fights with the Canaanites and conquered them many times and took slaves from among their conquered people. That has nothing to do with Ham. It has nothing to do with a belief that, uh, that God cursed Ham and therefore all black people are cursed and, and, and destined to, uh, to slavery. I said no such thing. And you, you did not hear me say any such thing. If you go back and read my letter as the Picayune printed it, and I'll give you a copy of the letter that I wrote to them if you want, it does not say any such thing, and I don't believe any such thing. Moreover, the Greek, the, the, uh, the, the words in the text, the Hebrew words in the text, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I have some, uh, some help in my library that, that, that help you to bridge the gap on certain things. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and that translation was made long before the time of Christ, and it was made by Jewish scholars in the Greek language. The Greek words that appear in uh, uh, that portion of, uh, of the scripture where I'm ju I just read from uh, Genesis 9 are the words paios, P-A-I-S, and oiketes, O-I-K-E-T-T-S. And, and those two Greek words, the first one means child, and the second one means household steward. It doesn't even have the concept of the bond slave, the doulos in Greek. Uh, the, the actual slave who had no freedom. It had to do with a childlike attendant or a household steward who had responsibilities, but he had a, a responsibility that was in subjection to someone who was the master of the household. It was a household service type thing. And all the Bible is saying there is that Canaan was prophesied by, by Noah, his grandfather, uh, to, to have a long range, down the line relationship to the Jews and to those who were not the descendants of Shem, but the descendants of Japheth, in those regards. In the book of Judges, you also have, in the first chapter in the 28th verse, and it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Tribute was a position of having to pay uh, a tax, having, having to pay a, a stipend of money in order to go on living where they were living. In other words, the, the Israelites had conquered the Canaanites, and the Canaanites were in a position of subjection to them. Both of those passages by many Bible scholars are regarded to be the fulfillment of the prophecy in Genesis 9 that, that uh, Noah made regarding Canaan. But Noah didn't say one word about Canaan, and, and a lot of people misunderstand that. Uh, Dr. Khalil obviously misunderstood it because he misquoted it. He cites all sorts of secular writers. I'm not familiar with those. I don't purport to be a scholar in these fields. He obviously is. He's been studying it for years. He speaks all over the country, all over the world, as a matter of fact, on these subjects. I'm not, I'm not begging uh, incompetence here. I'm simply saying I'm not prepared to deal with those things. I don't know half of these writers. In fact, the whole first part of Dr. Khalid's uh, presentation, I couldn't even hear. Maybe it's because I'm 63 years old and my ears aren't that good anymore. But until they put the microphone up here, I couldn't hear half of the words he was saying. So there may be a lot of things he said that I'm not able to even uh, deal with in this rebuttal. But I'll tell you one thing. I don't, you know, I, I, he quotes Freud. What's Freud got to do with the biblical concept that I presented? I have a master's degree in psychology and studied Freud in that respect, but I couldn't care less for Freud. He's a rank humanist. He certainly had no faith in God. He didn't have the kind of a religious perspective that I have about the things in the Bible. So I don't see what Freud and some of the secular writers that he refers to have anything to do with anything I said. Now, he does quote a lot of, of, of what he calls scholars who have various viewpoints about black Madonnas and black uh, Jesus in, in various parts of the world and all sorts of ancient inscriptions. I'm not prepared to deal with those things. I'm not an archaeologist. I don't have uh, any formal training in these fields. I certainly didn't spend any time this week trying to bone up on things like that. In the first place, I didn't know those were the things I would have to encounter. But in any event, I say this. Uh, there are, I'm, I'm confident there are just as many scholars, if not more scholars, who take opposite views from some of the things he quoted from the scholars that he, uh, that he depends upon. Those are matters that probably the human beings have been debating uh, through the centuries, and I don't know that anyone has, has a consensus uh, on those subjects. I would certainly like to see somebody much better prepared than I in the field that Dr. Khalid is prepared in to debate him on these subjects. Who they are. I'm just, look, I'm a simple lawyer practicing law and, and, and 
raising my family in the city of New Orleans and a member of the local church and have a faith in the Lord. And I'm here because I did not have any fear of coming here. But what I'm saying is, I don't have the credentials to be able to debate him on some of the on the on the things that he chose to make the primary aspect of his presentation. I do know this: that Jesus is not a Greek name. Jesus comes from the Hebrew word Yahshua, which is simply a Hebrew word. It's, a, it's, it's an English transliteration of, it, of the Hebrew word. And the Bible makes it plain that Jesus means Savior. I also know that Bethlehem in Hebrew does not mean what he said it means, the house of Ham. It means the house of David. And, and, and David, uh, you know, it's, it's the household of David's lineage. Not only does the Bible say that explicitly, but uh, the scores of other scholars that I've read. I can't quote them because I'm not, I'm not prepared. You know, I don't come here with that kind of information rolling off the top of my head. But I've read many scholars who show you that Bethlehem is the Hebrew word that means house of David. It has nothing to do with Ham. Josephus, I can see, it is a Jewish historian of great note in the first century, in the immediate, uh, in the time of Jesus uh, living. Whether he said what Dr. Khalid says he said or not, I don't know. I have a, a, a volume of Josephus at my home, but I haven't, you know, I, I'm not up on that point. I would have to go back and see. Uh, I just don't know. All right. I will not stoop to the indignity of referring to Dr. Khalid by anything other than his name, Dr. Khalid. I'm not going to call him something comparable to him to refer to me as that lying lawyer, that lying attorney, or that pale-faced cracker. If he wants to use, if he wants to use that kind of rhetoric uh, to, to, to gain your applause and to have you rocking and rolling with him, that's all right. That, that's what rhetoric's all about again. I came here in good faith believing we were going to have a dialogue on the, on the simple issue of was Jesus a black African of black African origin or was he not dealt with from the Bible. I tried to do that. I present it to you. I'm going to let the Lord use it as he sees fit and I'm going to let the matter lie there. Thank you.